Good morning. I invite you, if you would, to take a copy of the scripture with me and turn to Psalm 56. Psalm 56. Uh, if you don't have a copy of the Bible, there's one under a chair close by you. Psalm 56. I'm going to read the psalm in its entirety. Um, we'll begin with the inscription above that tells you the the timing of this psalm, which I'll explain as we begin the message. I invite you, if you will, to stand as we acknowledge this is the Word of God. To the choir master, according to the dove on far off terebinths, a mictum of David when the Philistines seized him in Gath. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape? In wrath cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Lord, we ask now, that you would take this psalm and apply it to our hearts. And I pray particularly for those who come in fearful today for whatever reason. I pray that they would be able to say, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. Lord, lead us to understand your word now. We plead in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. The inscription tells you when the Philistines seized him in Gath, a a, a mictum of David. This is a song intended for a choir. Now let's get the circumstances in our mind because actually the Psalms that we've just looked at are written after this event. We were in 1 Samuel 22 and 23 to the setting. Now we go back to 1 Samuel 21. David is fleeing from Saul. Saul is the king of Israel. David has been anointed king. Saul is in his mind convinced he needs to kill David. So he goes after him. David flees alone for his life with no provision, with no assistance. This is prior to the 400 valiant men who join him. He has just received just prior to this moment, food from Ahimelech and also Goliath's sword. Now that's very significant in your mind. He, he, the only weapon that he has some, enough food to eat from Ahimelech and Ahimelech gives him Goliath's sword. Ahimelech being a priest who had kept that significant defeat over Goliath and the Philistines. Immediately, David goes to Gath. You say, big deal. You know who lives in Gath? The Philistines. You know who grew up in Gath? Goliath. (laughs) I I don't know about you, but walking into town by yourself with Goliath's sword to say, hey, I'm here. This doesn't appear to be the smartest move on David's part at this moment. It's an absolute desperate moment. And when he gets there, the king, who's afraid of him, 
They sing about David's song. Saul is slain as thousands, but David is ten thousands. So David pretends to be insane and the king lets him go. But there's a very particular moment in 1 Samuel 21, verse 12, and it's what it says. And David took these words to heart. So while they're singing the song, mentioning the song about David and Saul, it says, he took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. David is much afraid, very scared of the king of Gath. So to get to Gath, you would say it displayed some courage, but now you also see fear. So this leads David to write this psalm. And here's what we want to see in the psalm, that when the fear of man appears to overtake you, trust in God and live. Now, the first principle I want to lay down is with the first few verses is that the fear of man and trust in God can be simultaneously experienced. There's no gradual buildup. David goes right to his plea. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me all day long. An attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. Now, do you see the redundancy there? Trample is twice. Attackers are twice. Oppression. There's just the build up of people causing him to suffer. They're, they're pursuing him. They won't let up. They just continue in their pursuit of him. The word oppress is like the words you would use to squeeze a, a lemon or an orange to get the juice out of it. His enemies trample all day long. It never ends all day. And to top it off, they're arrogant. They attack me proudly. But he says, be gracious to me, O God. In opposition to this pride, these arrogant people is the grace of God. And then he says, verse three, when I am afraid. Fear is a natural response. It is a response that all of us literally feel. There are moments in fear when the adrenaline will shoot through your body. Stunned, not knowing what to do in that moment. Here's what's very interesting. In everything David writes in the Psalms, and many of them are attributed to David, this is the only time David says clearly, I am afraid. I am afraid. Spurgeon wrote in response, unregenerate fear drives from God. Gracious fear drives to God. So you're at a moment here. If you're afraid, just think of your own life. It's a choice. I'm scared to death. Don't know what to do. Fleshly or unregenerate, aside from Christ, fear says, go the other way. Figure this out. Find a solution. But gracious fear that recognizes the grace of God drives us to him. So he says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. There's two things side by side. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. So faith is a deliberate act. It is in defiance to your emotional state. We don't give in to the emotion of the fear. The fear is real. But the deliberate act on behalf of the believer is to trust in God, to put or place our trust in God. Romans 8, 31 says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So it leads me to my second point. Then when fear of man appears to overtake you, trust in God. Verse four, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. And if you put verses three and four together, you see how this builds. You go from fear to trust to the word of God. The word of God brings trust and then you're not afraid. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? So as apart from a holy eternal God, 
What can flesh, what can flesh and bones, what can it do to me? William Wordsworth is famous for the phrase, man's inhumanity to man. What can one human do to another? Well, man can oppress you, slander you, hurt you, hate you, maim you, and kill you. That's not the answer David's looking for here. Those things are true. They're realities. But when David here is asking the question to himself, what can flesh do to me? Here's the answer. Nothing. Nothing. Now this, this, this comes out of David's understanding His understanding of who God is and what God has promised. The basis for fear is what a human can do to you. The basis for being afraid is what a human being cannot do to you. Now, before David gets to the full conclusion here, look at verse 5. He's very honest. Here's what people have done to him. He just lays it out. All day long, they injure my cause. All their thoughts are, for, are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They hide. They're covert. They watch my steps. They're watching everything I do as they have waited for my life. In other words, they want to kill me and they will not let up. It's all day long. It is constant. This ordeal never gets behind me. So David asked a question. For their crime, will they escape? Are they going to get away with this? And then he says, in wrath, cast down the peoples, O God. So David clearly here calls on God and here's what he's doing. He's calling on God to keep his word by destroying those who are opposed to David and his kingdom. Now let's think for a second about who's got David hemmed in. He's in Gath. The Philistines first have him trapped. It's his own doing. He's come there. But how did he get there? Because Saul and his soldiers are pursuing who now have surrounded David. He's about to escape to the cave, but he's trapped not only by the Philistine peoples, peoples in the, in in the scriptures referring to those who are not yet God's people, the peoples of the world here, specifically those who are not of Israel, those who are not the Jewish people. But notice what he says. Cast down the peoples, which would have included Saul and the people of Israel who were with Saul. Now that confused me. Why would, why would he say, cast down the peoples? And one author helped me. Because at this moment, Saul and those who are with him are acting as if they are not God's people. Because they are in opposition to what God has planned, that David would be the king. He continues to be real. You have kept count of my tossings. In other words, every night when I cannot sleep, when I just roll and turn and cannot find rest because my mind will not stop, you have not lost those things. You see those things. You have kept count of them. The tears that I've shed, the compassion that you have for me, oh God, if you have kept my tears in your bottle, are they not in your book? And this is not meaning that, that the prayer is that the tears have established some kind of credit balance with God. They are an appeal to God's compassion, an appeal to Ask God to be moved to action against his attackers, that the tossings and the tears will stop. And then in verse 9, he states as if it's done. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know. God is for me. How does he know that God is for him? Is that some kind of self-actualized statement? David just woke up this morning and thought, you know, God's on my side. 
God has told him. God has established a covenant with David that God is obliged himself to keep. This I know. God is for me. And this leads him in verse 10. In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. Now, if you didn't catch it, there is redundancy here. This is a chorus that is repeated. We do this all the time when we're singing a song. When I am af- in God, verse 4, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Now, there are two very subtle differences. In verse 10, it says, in God whose word I praise, and then repetition with a different word. In the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, the covenant name of God, in the Lord whose word I praise. Now, I don't expect you to know this, and I'm not going to take time to break it down. The Psalms, there are 150 Psalms, they're broken into five books, and there's not a, a specific order to that as to where the books begin and end. You're in book two of the Psalms, and here's one of the unique things about book two. The word Yahweh hardly ever appears, but right here it is. And when it does appear, it appears at a very significant moment. The word Elohim is the word that the Jewish people allowed themselves to speak. The word Yahweh, they did not want to say that was the proper name of God. It was only spoken or written in very significant moments. It is the name that God revealed of himself, binding him to keep his covenant with his people. So in Elohim, in God whose word I praise, in Yahweh whose word I praise. How do we know who God is? How do we know what God has promised? We know through his word what he has established and placed before us. So it is because of his word that we can say that we know who God is and what God has promised. So we can say with verse 11, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. This is from someone else's writing. So let me ask you, do you trust God? If you claim to be a Christian, then your claim is that you have trusted God in the matter of your salvation. This is the greatest thing you can trust him with, that God has saved you through Christ from sin and hell and judgment then if you are a Christian, if you are trusting in Christ, you believe that's what he has done. But if he has done that, can you not also trust him in the lesser things? Can you not trust him in the moments when you seem to be alone, like David? Can you not trust yourself, trust God when you find yourself in dangerous circumstances that cause you to give over to fear and desperation? In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Now for David, his logic here is very simple. If God has said that he will be king, there's nothing that a human being can do to prevent it. Thus David's rhetorical question as to what can flesh accomplish against him is based on the fact that God's promise to him and his confidence in God's character, that God will keep his word and no man will prevail against him. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 8. One author said, you should read every psalm twice. You should first read the psalm from the perspective of the psalmist, quite often David, and then you should read the psalm from the perspective of Jesus Christ. Jesus facing his own people on the cross would say, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? And in Jesus' case, they killed him. And you say, why do you say that? Listen to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 11. 
For the Lord spoke, spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of the people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. Now, let me just pause here and make a very immediate application. No matter who wins next Tuesday, there'll be a conspiracy theory. It's where we're at now. Let's keep everybody stirred up. Keep everybody afraid. Hear what God says? Do not call conspiracy all these people cause conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear nor be in dread. The Lord of hosts, him you shall honor him as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. He will become a sanctuary that is a safe place for his people. How's he going to do this? How's he become, become a sanctuary for his people? He will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense, a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and they shall stumble upon it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. That text is referred to over and over again in the New Testament about Jesus Christ, who is the stone of offense that his own people stumbled over, but he has become the rock which is used over and over again in Psalms. He is the rock of our salvation. He is the foundation in which we stand because of Christ and what he has accomplished on the cross and through the power of resurrection. We can hope in Christ for our salvation. And we move forward to not trust in the ways of man or to despair because of the ways of man because we know that he provides the way for our living. Third point, that when fear of man overtakes you, trust in God and live. Now the psalm starts out as a lament, but it moves through a petition to thanksgiving and a statement of faith. At the beginning of the psalm, David's enemies are trying to trample him. At the end of the psalm, David confidently states that he will walk before God in the light of life. He says, I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thanks offerings to you. Not as a payment for his prayer, but as an expression of his devotion to the God in whom he trusts. Verse 13, for you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of life. Because the Lord Jesus Christ's soul was delivered from death, because he rose from the grave, we too have the same hope that we have been delivered. Our soul has been delivered from death. Yes, our feet from falling. So that here's what matters in our daily life, that we can walk before God in the light of life. God becomes the aim of our life. It's the wicked who are wandering around trying to find the right path. If we are in Christ, we have found the path. We have turned to God and we trust him. And that means now we gotta renounce our wisdom, our strength, our attempts to avenge ourselves and our belief that we can pres preserve our own lives. Here's what we've gotta do. We gotta trust in the Lord with all our heart. Not lean on our own understanding. And, and, and I, I've, I've talked to none with people who are struggling and go, but you don't understand my situation. No, I do not. I do not. But God does. And here's what God tells you and me. Do not lean on your own understanding. In other words, you're never going to get it figured out. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And what will he do? He'll make your path straight. Straight. You walk in the light of life. Here's what's fascinating. I don't expect you to remember this, but turn to Psalm 34. Just go to your left, Psalm 34. It's a long time ago when I preached Psalm 34. And it was a long sermon. I looked at it. Bless your hearts. <clears throat> now here's what's Here's what is so fascinating, how the Psalms are put together. I could study the Psalms for the rest of my life. 
Psalm 34 was written at the same, about the same time frame of David's life as Psalm 56 of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. Now, here's what's more fascinating. Psalm 56, I would argue, and others, was written before Psalm 34. So here, here's a way to imagine it. While David is by himself, not knowing what's going to be next, and by all accounts looks like he's going to die, he writes Psalm 56. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. Now, ratchet ahead later. I actually said this in the sermon months or days and David and his 400 men are sitting in a cave and they're being pursued and he says hey guys let me sing you a song I want to sing you a song about what it was like when Saul and the Philistines were about to enclose on me listen to my song I will bless the Lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. You see it? Not people. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Taste and see. In other words, hey boys, don't give in to your fear right now. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. I've got a so what question. I, I, I'm, I, I'm, my prayer is to bring this home to 2022. As the fear of man closes in around me, am I trusting God and living? Let me phrase it in the plural. As the fear of man closes in around us, are we trusting God and living? Brothers and sisters, for most of us in this room, for most of the people who live in our culture, it's not the fear of death. But there's some real fears going on right now. And it's, it's, it's a shared fear. It's not just individual. There's a real question out there. What, what are God's people going to do? What are we going to do? Now for some, the fear of death is a reality. I said, when Russia invaded Ukraine, I said, if you were a pastor or you were a member of a local church, what would you do? Would you leave? Ukraine made it easy for the men. No men are allowed to leave, so the pastors are still there. This week, I read about a pastor and his wife in Kiev, and she stayed with him. She's kind of famous on Facebook now because daily she reports. She had some experience in reporting and she reports of actually what's going on and then, then she points people to hope. In the article I read when she talked about the first time they began to bomb Kiev, she said, and I quote, 
we had nowhere to run but to God. Nowhere to run but to God. And as the interview went on, she, they concluded the, the article with this statement. She said, quote, Peace is not from yourself, but from the one you trust. You trust God and live. The same is true for us as we face the fears that are in front of us. I just want to mention two. One is the fear of losing our rights to say what we believe and the consequences if we say them. I want to teach you for a moment, whether you're a member here or not, today you're at a Baptist church. Most people think that just means we baptize by immersion. But there's, there's, a, there's a deeply held conviction among Baptist people that's kind of lost in the modern age, and that is the belief in religious freedom. It's not a political belief. Baptists believed that our right, our ability to express what we believe comes from God. And you go back and study church history. Your Baptist forefathers and mothers lost their lives in governments because they would not shut up. Because when they were afraid, they trusted God and lived. And let's just get down to the brass tacks of it. It's the fear of losing your job. If I don't go with the liberal move that's on right now, I'm going to lose my job. If I don't say what they want me to say, I'm going to lose my job. Do I think you ought to be a jerk at work? Do I think you ought to stomp your foot and act like an unregenerate person? Absolutely not. But do I think if you're a follower of Christ, you ought to act like one and speak like one? Absolutely, because that's what the Bible tells you to do. Now, I'm reading from Hebrews and a connection linked up with me. This happened a little bit ago. I've quoted this verse multiple times. What can man do to me? If you go back and listen to my sermons, it's there a lot. I mainly am quoting from Hebrews 13, 6. So if you turn there with me, Hebrews 13, 6. We can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? It's also Psalm 118. Now, I want you to watch what's happening here. Let's put it in context. The Hebrew Christians, Hebrew background people, considering abandoning Christianity. That's why the book of Hebrews is written. Now, here's one of the core arguments. It's subtle, but it's right here. I'll read it and then explain it. Verse 5 precedes verse 6, right? Listen to what it says. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Do you get the connection? Money does not determine how we live out our faith. The Lord God Almighty determines how we live out our faith. And here's what it says. He will never leave me or forsake me. That's a promise from God. So when you're faced with a decision at work, and I I know I've had this conversation over and over again the last two years. When you're faced with a decision, here's what you need to say to yourself. He will never leave me nor forsake me. I can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? We are not defined by the world. We are not defined by our circumstances. We are defined by Christ. For he has delivered our souls from death. He has kept our feet from falling. That we may walk before God in the light of life. I am 
confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. In Christ, we can face difficult people, the harsh realities of cancer and disease, the threats of job loss, and the pains of life. Now, Lord, give me mercy to say what I want to say next. Our brother, Stephen Littlejohn, who went from this church to plant Battleground along with a host of other brothers and sisters, found out this week that he has a very serious form of cancer. Very serious. You pray for him in the next few minutes as he stands before that congregation and tells them that he has a very grim diagnosis. We're the same age, basically. And yesterday we were talking about our family and his parents who are part of this church and the church, the congregation. And Stephen said, praise God, I'm preaching on Psalm 55 tomorrow. I said, what? You see, when they left, we were both preaching in the Psalms and then pastoring the church. They started preaching expositionally other places. He said, I got the conviction a few months ago that I needed to go back to the Psalms. Praise God that I did. I said, Stephen, wait till next Sunday. And I got off the phone and then I sent him another text and I sent him what we're about to sing. That you may walk before God in the light of life, Stephen, morning by morning, day by day, moment by moment. We trust God and live. That's who we are. We are God's people. So wherever you're at, whatever fear is right up in your face, may God give application to your heart that you might trust God and live. Let's pray. Lord, I plead on behalf of every person gathered There are people in this room with very grim news themselves. There are people in this room who will face those kind of things in the future. There are people in this room whose job hangs in the balance. Lord, help us now. Help us to apply your word to our hearts and by faith to trust you. Thank you for the gift of song. And I pray now that you would take the song and that you would apply it to our hearts and that the people of God would erupt in praise to you and faith and that we would encourage one another with your words. Speak now, I pray. Help us, I pray. Do what only you can do. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand and sing together.